Yeah. A big one too. All right. I don't know who's making the improvements on those trees out there, but or the bushes, but maybe Les or maybe Vaughn or maybe both. Who knows? I think Les was out there last night. Was he? Yeah. All right, I'm going to start. You ready? Did uh, did he have water sprinkling in the back? Oh, well, he doesn't have a backyard lot. I think this is a, a, a day that we're supposed to water our backyard, but he has to water his in buckets. For I'm holes. I'm allowed Tuesdays and Saturdays. That's it. In Those my house. Days? Yeah. At home. Yes. Yeah, we can do three days. You're lucky. <laughs> yeah, but we may run out of water too. That would not be good. Yeah. All right. Okay. Shoot. Okay, okay. Well, I'm here with my wonderful father-in-law. Careful. <laughs> uh, Ted Newton Klein. Does that work? That's the word. That's it. Okay. And um, the date today. What is the date today? Today. Is the 23rd of June 2015. 23rd of June 2015. And how old are you? Uh, this week I'm uh, 79. Nine. That's right. And you were born. I think about that, you know. It's getting, uh, <laughs> getting past me. <laughs> what, uh, what year were you born? 1936. And where were you born? Oklahoma City. All at right. The, at the house. With, we called the doctor, but they didn't get there until I was delivered already. Really? Yeah. So you came out all by yourself? I came out all by myself, <laughs> and I've been doing the same thing all the rest of my life. Well, that's a good thing. All right, so you were born in Oklahoma City, mm -hmm. and how many brothers and sisters did you have? Right. And can you could you name them all? I can name all of them. Okay, in order. The last name is uh, Klein. Obviously. Yes. <laughs> and the oldest one is Jack J. Klein. Okay. And I don't know what year he was born, but I think it was 1926 or something like that. And then uh, the second one was born was Oren Aaron Klein. And he was about two years behind. J. No, the first one. Right. Jack J. Jack J. And then the third one was uh, Pearl Minette. Okay. Klein. Uh, these names came from other members of the family. Okay. After Pearl came, um, let's see, Ivan. Okay. And <clears throat> I don't even remember, <clears throat> remember Ivan middle name, but um, Ivan was the next one. And then after that was David. Okay. And David was uh, David Albert, named after his grandparents. Okay. And then the next one was Ted Klein, me. And the next one was Rowena. Um, Rowena Patricia, I believe it was her name. Okay. Then the next, next one was Elfrida uh, Joyce, I believe, was her middle name. And then the last one was uh, John, who is still living. And he and I are the only two living out of the nine children. Wow. And uh, with that big, big of a family, we were on... Uh, on the blessings of my my grandmother, uh, she was still alive, and she took the money that she had to leave to the children, and she said, "I want to see them with what they're going to do with what we are going to don't uh, give them." And so she had her son Roy Albert take each one of the brothers and sisters in his family and go and find a home for them and then buy it with her money. Wow. And that's how we got the 160-acre farm that we lived on out in Lincoln County, Oklahoma. Okay. 
nine miles from the county seat of Chandler. And with that, we sat there and uh, stayed there from um, 1940 to 1950. And I was four when we moved there. Okay. <clears throat> I remember clearly there was a two-story farmhouse there, no foundation, built on just some loose rocks that the people found when they were building the house. And the stairwell was, um, you, you go just two or three steps and then you turn to go up behind the wall of the, of the kitchen. And in a farmhouse, the kitchen is very large. Right. So the, the, um, on the way up the stairs, halfway up, you make another turn to go on up to the very top of the staircase. And there was a room that was storage or whatever you wanted to use it for. Mm -hmm. So with that, we, um, the, we would go in there and sleep in there because it was a flat floor plenty of room and the kids could play and do whatever they wanted because you're right over the top of the kitchen, mom and dad could easily tell what who's what doing. And right. Were there beds or? No bed, just a blanket on the floor. Okay. And then um, when winter came, uh, we got beds and we, my mother made the bed sheets and bed clothes and stuff to make the beds be warm enough at night and we slept um, in that time when I was four to five or six I was the middle one of the three of us David Ivan and me mm -hmm. so uh, we got along fine sometimes fighting which is normal with boys especially okay on the on the farm okay so let, one more thing so how many boys and how many girls there was three girls okay. and six boys. Six boys, okay. I was and number six of the family. Okay. And what, um, on the farm, what were you farming? We mostly were doing, um, we had a bunch of cows, which we used for food, and we used for milk, and we used for um, raising calves that we could sell. And my mother was a pretty good farmer because her father was a farmer. And she went through the, cal the calves as they were born and decided which ones would be kept <clears throat> and which ones would be sold or eaten. Right. And that was caused because Dad did not know anything about that. Okay. Dad didn't, was not a farmer, didn't know how to farm. What did your dad do? My dad was a um, machinist, and he worked at Tinker Air Force Base in Oklahoma City, which was 50 miles from our farm. Now, 50 miles today is not very far, but right. 50 miles when the car was a 1932 Chevy with a rumble seat in the back, um, and that's what we had at one time because he liked that car. Right. Well, that car got smashed one time by a guy that was drunk, and he ran into it so hard that it knocked it all the way across the street and um, totaled it. <laughs> wow. And then what did you do for a car? Well, Dad went and bought another one, I guess. Okay, uh, but he was he was traveling 50 miles to and from work? Yes. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And um, and that's a long, long trip in a 32 Chevy. I would imagine so. Yeah. He also had um, gone to some kind of a... I don't know where he went to go, but he came back home with a hearse and a flower wagon, which were both built on a Cadillac frames, and it had what we would call today uh, something like our uh, Chevrolet Suburban, mm -hmm. a big, long thing that would hold a, a body in a casket, and the other one was a flower wagon, and they were totally in in lock uh, and lined inside with leather. All the walls were leather, the ceiling was level and leather, uh, level, <clears throat> leather. leather. Yes. And my mother would drive that over to 
the grocery store, which was two and a half miles where our girth, our school was. And we would go and into that uh, store, and there was a black man that, that worked in the store, and he knew that this, these two vehicles were um, for people who are dead right. or dying. And he was scared to touch the cars. He was afraid that when he had to lo uh, pick up a 100-pound load of, of uh, cattle feed or hog feed or something, and he'd carry it on his shoulder, but he'd want us to open the door, and then he'd kind of throw it into the back of the truck. He didn't want to touch those cars because he thought they were still full of dead, dead ghosts, I guess. Huh. And, uh, so Superstitious. Was, yeah. All right. Um, tell me, when did you meet your wife, Beverly? Well, my, my wife met me before I met her. How old were you, do you think? I was in, um, I was, when I was... You know what, to scratch that question, I want to ask you, what, as you were a child, we'll get back to Beverly in a minute, but when you were a child, what did you do for fun? What were some of your hobbies or things? On the farm? That, yes. Or, you know, with your friends or whatever. What did you do for fun? Well, we worked all day, okay. every day, mm -hmm. either for our farm or a neighbor's farm for pay. We would get uh, $3 a day for working for morning work. It was dark when we left the house. It was dark when we came home. Wow. At the end of that day, though, you're dirty because we're doing hay baling, we're doing thrashing, doing all kinds of farming stuff. Right. And what we would do is run from the house across the 160 acres to the uh, pond and go swimming, yeah. nude. Mm -hmm. And we would drop our clothes as we were going. We, we could see if we could run without tripping ourselves. We're always daring the world to be bigger than we were. We thought we were bigger than the world, you know. So we would uh, go to the farm, I mean go to the uh, pond and swim and clean up our bodies because we didn't have any running water. Wow. So we cleaned ourselves in the, in the pond. And that was, that's, I don't know how far it was from the house to there, but it was all the way across the 160 acres, which is, uh, I've forgotten how many feet it is from the house. Anyway, it's, it's about a quarter of a mile at least, half a mile maybe. Okay. Um, now, w would you say your relationship with your parents was a good relationship? Did you ever get in trouble? I mean, how did they punish you when you guys were bad? Um, I was the third in ages. I was the lowest one. Right lowest number of years old all the way through because we came through like that and my my I would watch my brother John or uh, Ivan or David uh, getting punished for things so I said I don't want to be punished so I tried to do what they told me to do and they thought that was just wonderful well, it is, except then when the boys get me separately, uh, they want to beat me up because I never get a beating. <laughs> and uh, so that was just the, the, the way that, because of my age to their age to their age. So they would beat you up. They were the boss and I was the peon. Right. Or peon, as you want to call it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and your relationship with your dad, fond memories of your dad and your mother? Well, dad was always driving from the farm into Oklahoma City, which was uh, 50 miles. Right. And he would stay in there because we had moved from a home in Oklahoma City uh, that was in what was becoming an uh, oil field. And he worked in that oil field before he was, became a, 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 what do you call him? Uh, blank moment. That's okay. Um, he was a, what did I tell you he was? A machinist. A machinist. Right. All right. When he went to work for Tinker Air Force Base, that was after he had moved from working in the oil fields. Okay. And so he worked there first, and we lived right among those oil fields. 
in the Oklahoma City. Well, the Oklahoma City has a lot of oil under the ground, or used to be. <clears throat> so um, that's what happened. And what did we do for fun? We primarily worked, and secondarily, we got the right to go fishing in the pond and swimming in the pond. And we would use our 22. We had one 22 single shot rifle, cost $12. And it was for the three of us, and we had to share it. So that's why I have hard hearing today. <laughs> we laid this up, the, the uh, rifle, on the shoulder of one of the three boys. And then the, the next one, after he, he <clears throat> the first one shoots his squirrel or rabbit or whatever he's shooting, and then the gun would go to the next boy down, David. And David would then have me put the gun on my shoulder and then my turn to shoot and I would have to get David or Ivan to stand still while I shot and uh, so that's how we hunted with one rifle for three guys wow. and when you go we'd, we'd leave the house with maybe three bullets in our hand that's all we had right so we'd get one shot each but with that one shot, we'd come back with three squirrels or three rabbits or a mixture of those. You guys were good shots. Well, we had a lot of experience on it. <laughs> yes, we did. Okay, and how about, um, okay, so now, going back to Beverly. Wh when did you meet Beverly? How old were you? Well, Beverly and I were uh, three years apart. So when she was a freshman in high school, I was a senior. Okay. When... I was in the going to the, uh, we had we had uh, cabinets, you know, that the books would be stored in between classes. Mm -hmm. So if we had to go and get our books, this girl was always in standing in front of my. You no, know, I was all she was always um, trying to get to her books because my I was standing right by the door to go into the room that I'm going to go into for the next class. So it ends up with um, her having to uh, move out of the way. And I didn't notice her at all. I was not interested in girls. I was studying. I wanted to learn because none of my family had ever graduated from high school and college all the way through college. And I wanted to do that because I figured out that if, if I didn't get an education, I'm going to be like them. And I don't want to be like them. So I uh, put education high on my list of things to do. Okay. And then, <clears throat> after I went into college, she's still in high school, three years behind me. Where did you go to college? I went to college at, uh, uh, in Edmond, Oklahoma. Okay, what was the school? What was the school? Yeah. It was, uh, <clears throat> what's, what do they pay the name of that thing? Central... I don't think, I can't remember right now. That's okay. But, uh, so you went to college in Oklahoma City? Not Oklahoma City. Oh, okay. Edmond, Oklahoma. Edmond, Oklahoma. 15 miles from the edge of Oklahoma City okay. to Oklahoma. Now it's all one town. Okay. It's all fit built in. But um, with, with the, with the uh, three years that Beverly was behind me, I didn't pay any attention to her, and I didn't date during these time, these months and years because, again, I had no money, I had no car, I had no anything except get an education so I can have some of these things. Right. That was what's running in the, through my head. So uh, then one day, Dad, after my mother died in May of 54, my mother was uh, not quite 50 years old, two, two months short of being 50. And she had had the nine children, and she's a, big, she's a farmer's daughter, but she knows how to work and work a lot. And anyway, when I went to see uh, Rowena, who had gone with my dad to go to Georgia, where my brother Oren was in the military, in the Navy, and he was a uh, doctor's type of doctor. So, he, I mean, he's not shooting, he's serving, he's 
fixing people to get hurt. Okay. He was a, uh, like a, nerd, a doctor. Okay. So Oren um, lived all the way down in Georgia, and we lived in Oklahoma. So when Mom passed away and she was buried and everything, um, and she died at how how old was she? She was uh, forty nine years old and almost well two more months, and she would have been fifty. When she passed away. When she passed away. Wow. Okay. And it was a cancer stomach, stomach okay. cancer. Lots of stories about that if you wanted to hear all of it, but it's garbage otherwise. So, <laughs> um, but, but with Beverly, um, the way I met her when I first noticed her as a woman and someone of interest was when Rowena and Dad went to Georgia halfway, I mean, they didn't even get out of Oklahoma. And the highway had been um, cleaned off on the shoulder so that there was a large, well, more than a foot of drop off from the uh, basic road. So Dad saw a truck coming in the opposite direction. It was a big uh, gasoline truck carrying gas to the smaller towns. And as it came by, Dad had to move over and he got off of that drop onto the dirt, mm -hmm. but his wheel wouldn't even touch the dirt. So he couldn't get back up on the highway. And he was moving as fast as a car would do that, probably 45, 50 okay. miles an hour. So when he pulled and kept pulling the steering wheel to get back on the, the uh, road, um, it finally came up on the road because with three wheels pulling on the road, it pulled it up, that back wheel got pulled up onto the road. Well, it was so quickly uh, moving that <clears throat> the, the car went all the way across the road. Fortunately, no car hit him then, but the truck had already gone by and he went off on the other side. So then he had to go back on again to get back. And when he did, he had that same problem with the back on the other wheel. Well, what he did was he kept yanking the steering wheel to get it to get him back on the road. And the car turned and rolled. And the, the uh, telephone wire long uh, pole, oh. the, uh, the post. Right. That's what came right across the front at the window, the front window of the car, hitting where Ron was, or not Ron, where um, Rowena was sitting. And it broke her third and her fifth backbone bone. Wow. And because of that, she became a hospital person for the rest of her life. She only died in about when she was uh, around 20, 21 years of age. I don't know the date exactly, but okay. I got it in the uh, family tree. Okay. So with, um, with that, that ended the trip to Oren's and Rowena went into the hospital, so Oren didn't get a member of the family right away. Later, we got John to go down and live with Oren and then he went and lived the other. But I'm getting off the subject because I'm trying to get you back to right. meeting with uh, Beverly. So, so it had something to do with Rowena, I'm getting. Well, yes. When What happened was uh, Rowena was in the hospital in Oklahoma City and uh, I went to see her because I was working in Oklahoma City at the bank and doing night transit. And when I came in to see uh, Rowena in the hospital, there was this woman that came out of the hospital, a young woman, and she had on a red coat with a dark fur type collar, and that was uh, Beverly. Okay. I went into the hospital and I said, I just saw the most beautiful woman you ever saw. And she said, oh yeah, who is her? What's her name? I said, I have no idea. If I knew who it was, I'd marry her. And Rowena said, well, tell me what she looks like. So I told her, and she said, well, that's my friend 
No, uh, Beverly. Beverly. And I said, you know her? And he said, yeah. I said, she has the most beautiful walk. She's proud of herself. And she's brilliant looking. And she's just too much to pass up on what her address. She said, well, Newton, you, you've, uh, you're making enough money that you could afford to buy me a little radio, I think, and I don't have any radio here, and I just lay here in bed all day, every day, and I want a, a radio. You you can do that, and I'll see if I can get your address for it. Sounds me. like blackmail. It is. <laughs> but that's the way women are in those days. They don't have much other power. <laughs> so that's how I met Beverly, through that connection. But I never did get, I got the next day, I came back with the radio. It was six dollars, I remember that. It cost me six dollars to get that radio. And it's like something you'd sit on the next, next to your bed. Right. And she could listen to music and news and whatever. So, <clears throat> but she didn't give me an address. She didn't have an address yet. So I said, well, you tell me about where she lives because you rode the bus, she rode the bus to the school and you didn't have to ride the bus. Did you ever go, or how did you know where she lived? Well, she, they rented Beverly's house, a family. And Beverly's family uh, uh, lived out in the country on a rented house that sat on an acre on a part of a big ranch. Okay. So they rented that house, and I went to that house, and yes, Beverly was standing behind the refrigerator that's out on the on the porch. Okay. Well, it's in the back back uh, little room. But uh, I was at the door, and I was talking with her mother, Yvonne. <clears throat> and I told her that I was there to find Beverly, and if, if um, I could meet her, I would like to take her to the movie and take her to dinner and whatever. And her mother thought that was just wonderful, but Beverly was telling, was hiding behind that refrigerator, and she wouldn't let me know that she was there. But she she overheard everything I said, so I told her what I wanted to do, and I told her to, I would be back. Told her mother that I would be back to get Beverly at uh, five o'clock the following day, and we'd go for dinner and then go to the movies. And that's how I met Beverly, but um, after that, it's all another story. <laughs> okay, so how about, how was the first date? How was that night? Very typically, she has not changed a lot between then and now even. Okay. Uh, she was scared to death. She had been dating a guy, and she felt guilty that I took her, but I think her mother talked her into it because I was a banker, they thought. All I was was a clerk that was handling paper right. checks, checks, you know. And so uh, I, uh, <laughs> I guess I impressed the mother m enough that I got the first date with Beverly. But what we did was I went to, we went to a restaurant. Beverly had been working in a restaurant huh? and she knew about doing the work in the restaurant, but when we went in, it was a nicer restaurant, and she would not order anything, and so I ordered something for her, and something for myself, and I ate my dinner, but she didn't eat a bite of hers. She was just as stiff and scared as she could be, and then driving down the road, going to the theater, uh, she was glad when we got into the dark theater because that way she couldn't be seen so much. She was very unsecure with herself, okay. and she still is. And that's the way the first date went. Okay, so how long after the first date? Obviously, you kept going out with her. I kept going out with her for some time. Did it get better? Well, no. And it still hasn't in many ways. But, <laughs> but during that time, I was in, in uh, college, 
and I went to summer school and I met a girl there, so I dropped Beverly. Didn't go see her anymore for okay. about, oh, close to a year. And um, she was dating this other guy, James, I think was his name. I don't know what his last name was. But um, what I did is I dated this girl, but she wanted to get married as soon as I would get married with her. The girl you were dating? The, the girl I was dating. She was a farmer's daughter of German descent, um, and she took us. We went to a lake, and it had a park and campground and all. We went there <clears throat> just for the views and to save money. It, it wasn't much money. <laughs> so with that, uh, she brought a really nice dinner, which was home fried chicken and salads and desserts and all made a really impressive thing on me and her family were pretty successful farmers and had a lot of property and my dad kept telling me that's the girl I should marry don't marry Beverly because Beverly is not the kind of girl for you and he was right probably but uh, <laughs> so be it we'll leave that out of the conversation okay. later <laughs> but anyway we um, dated throughout the summer and that girl had gotten for her birthday or something a brand new Chevrolet 1954 wow. I think it was 55 something like that um, sedan and the car every time you'd come to a stoplight and I was driving it she'd be on the passenger side and I would put the brakes on and the motor would die every time I would do a stop and she said well we've had it taken into the shop and nobody knows how to fix it and I said don't know how to fix it they're farmers they ought to know how to fix everything on this damn car you know so she said what do you think gonna fix it big smart guy you know and I said well obviously the motor is loose on its base and if you tighten that up in the right position, if the motor wouldn't go forward, which pulls the go, uh, gas take, uh, thing, filling the motor with fuel, it, it would uh, stop doing that, you know? Because it, I think it's just sliding on the, on the base that's holding the motor. So she went home and told her dad that, and her dad uh, checked it, and it sure enough that it was exactly what it was. So that made her want more, I'm, I'm going to be a good farmer. And that's what they were been planning for me, you know. But uh, that was just part of the day. Okay, so when did you finally decide to marry Beverly? Or how did that, how did you propose? Or how did that come around? <clears throat> well, the day that, um, that every time I could, I would go and, and be with her because going home to dad is... All he was doing was just getting old, like me now. And uh, so Dad uh, was lonely. He was glad when I came, but Beverly would never come in the house even. So he didn't particularly like her, but he liked this German girl. And so during the time I was dating her, he was happy. When I got off of dating her, I went back to Beverly because I really thought still a lot about her. <coughs> but what did we do? What did we do? We taken her to dinner and that was a wasted meal every time you go. So quit doing that. Didn't have that dollar and a half dinner cost, you know. Right. And so what we did was um, we would uh, go and sit on a park bench or visit with someone else or whatever, but she's not a social type person much. So um, time was scarce because I was working all the, all the time I wasn't in school. And so we just, um, we just talked mostly, but she didn't talk. I would talk and she didn't listen. And there was one time when we went just for a drive, 
many times we went on just drives and we went to places where there was a, a place that I was real impressed with that was for at Easter time and other religious uh, times of the okay. year. The, everybody would go to their place and it was in a little valley and the, uh, there was seats up around um, on the around the valley and you could sit there and watch the Easter type or Christmas type of meetings that were going on. So we did do that a number of times and then one time we went just for a drive out into the countryside because I like the country and she did too. But she doesn't know a doom thing about uh, the, the farming. <clears throat> but then her brother, Rainer, was in FFA. He's about three years younger than she is, two or three years. And he was in FFA and she was all excited because he had a pig, uh, a, a sow, that had a baby um, livery. <laughs> And with that, um, she would be out in the barn, and I would go there, and we would talk about the pigs and all about how great Rainer is doing and everything else. She always talks about somebody else, not her. Okay. So um, that's the kind of thing that we did. We we would go to movies, but she would sit there just like a frozen frog. <laughs> Okay, so when did you decide and when did you ask her to marry you or how did... <laughs> <clears throat> By that time she was going to college, that was the first year of her college, and she rented a home, a bedroom in a home in Edmond. Okay. I lived in Edmond across town. And so I had a 1929 Ford Model A and I went to see her we'd been talking about getting married and she was n not real clear that she wanted to or didn't want to she still was worried that she had to somehow get rid of this guy James okay and she would talk about James not about him, but I've got to take, I, I can't just marry you until I cut off whatever I got to do with him. Okay. And I said, well, do you need help? I'll go help you to take care of him. <laughs> so All right. I was going to knock him out if I had to, and I could have probably done it easily, because I was strong then. So um, the day that we were going to get married, which was December the 17th, of 2000, I mean of uh, 1957. Okay. I took her back to the lady's house that she'd rent a room in. And that lady was a high class lady in our books in those days. She had interesting books that would bring me over to her house and I could borrow books from her library and go read them and I like doing that just like I still do. Right. So I told Beverly that I would pick her up at that house that morning. She said, well, no, I won't be there. I'm going to be out at with my parents' house because I have to get dressed and all. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, I'll pick you up there at, uh, I think I said, 6 o'clock in the afternoon or something because we were going to get married and then we were going to go on a honeymoon to our, uh, Arkansas to a college where we might end up going if we were looking for more better schools than okay. Edmund. So we, uh, she gave me her wedding ring that I, I mean her uh, engagement ring that I'd given her and told me that she didn't want to get married. Okay. And I said, you're going to get married and I'm going to marry you tomorrow morning just like I told you. Okay. And she said, okay, take me home. So I took her home. I came back and she was all ready. 
So we got in the car and went down. We went to uh, a preacher's house. She was Catholic. I was not. And I was Baptist. So I went to a Baptist preacher's house and dad came and her mother came. That's the only two people that came. So um, I gave the, the, the uh, preacher five bucks after he gave us the wedding permit, you know, and all. And then we uh, took off for Arizona, or Arkansas. Arkansas. And we got um, down there. I was in a 54 Chevrolet at that time. Didn't even have a radio, but I bought one and put it on the car seat. So we could listen to music as we get, went. We got down there to uh, Arkansas to the college and walked around and enjoyed that a bit. Went, went to, um, the next day and traveled around in the area of Arkansas, in that area. And then we headed back home. On the way home, we ran out of gasoline. Um, I knew it was getting down, so I, but I didn't have any more money. Well, we picked up a high, pit, uh, high hitchhiker. hitchhiker, and when he found out we didn't have any money to buy any more gas, he said, well, I'll buy the gas if you're going to take me that way. So that's how we got home. Back wow. Home. Okay. We were that poor. Now, how, how soon after that did you have your first child? Mark well, we was got born in December 17th of, of uh, 2000 or to uh, 1957, and Rowena, I mean, uh, Mom? Yeah, no, not uh, my oldest daughter is Levon. Right. Levon was born on February the 6th of a year and, and a month and a half more. Okay. So and about, she was born in Oklahoma? She was born in, uh, no, she was born in California because when I got out of college, I was getting out of college, but I was switching from civil engineering, which I'd taken for the first two years, but then the school wouldn't offer that subject. I would have to go to Oklahoma University and that was going to take my job away because I'd have to get down there and back and my old car was, well it was a 54 Chevy at that time, right. but um, that, that trip down there was like 20 some 30 miles or so, which was like 100 miles here mm -hmm. today. And the car, uh, I mean, the uh, cost of going there was way higher. It was a university. And my college was a Central State, Central State College was the name of okay. the College. So uh, I couldn't afford to make the change. So I had to go to what they offered. They only offered one graduate uh, service, whatever it is. And that would be education, teaching. And at that time, the whole nation, it seemed like, needed men teachers because the people, all of them were women, I guess, and they wanted to get more men teachers. So they talked me into becoming a man teacher for elementary school. That's where the need was. You'd be dead sure that you'd get a job okay. if you had that degree. So that's what I did. So. Okay, and now I know Mark was born in Oklahoma, yes? Yes. So Vaughn was born in California. Why was I in Oklahoma? Why did you go back to Oklahoma? When I was in college, I was studying, as I said, the courses that I needed for, for civil engineering. Okay. When I had to switch over, certain of those things were higher education or higher uh, um, different people would take that courses because I was taking mathematics, all of them. Okay. Solid in solid method uh, of uh, medicine, all the um, different kinds of mathematics, okay. and the, the school 
at Pittman uh, was teaching me all of the things that I could at the first level of all the things that I would need as a civil engineer. Okay. But they couldn't go through and give me a degree in it. Okay. So I had to switch to education and when I did that, some of my courses wouldn't switch. Right. So I didn't have enough credits to graduate from college. So you had to go back to Oklahoma. So I had to go back to Oklahoma or start over here and it would have taken me two years uh -huh. here. Okay. And so I went back to Oklahoma with Beverly and then we went up to Perry, Oklahoma. Well, back with Beverly and at that time LaVon also. Say it again. Because LaVon was already born, so you went back with Beverly and LaVon, and then Mark was born in Oklahoma. Right. And then you moved back to California. Right. And permanently. Been back here ever since. And do you remember what year that was when you... Yeah, it would be the second year. The first year I taught was um, in... Uh, Southern California, 57, 58, it would have been uh, 59. Okay. That there were other, um, and then your third child, Valerie, was my, your, my, my wife, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, was born in 62. Yeah. Okay. And now you have. She was two years apart. But the funny thing was, both Vaughn and Mark are born on the, the same, same day, day, but a year apart. Yes, that is always that's and, interesting. And the guys in the school that where I worked always wanted to know how did you plan that that close, you know? And I said, well, if you only get sex once time one time a year, <laughs> and of course I'd give them a big laugh, and that's all they wanted, you know. <laughs> um, okay, now I'm going to ask you to tell me. A little something about each of your children. Good so those kids in the world. Start with Vaughn. With Vaughn? Yeah. Well, with Vaughn. And my like kids are the best kids in the world, so. <laughs> <laughs> After mine. <laughs> um, what about Levon? She. Um, what kind of a child was she? What do you remember about her? Oh, she was a busy body little girl. Um, and she was not afraid to challenge anything, and she wanted to be smarter than dad and mom and all that. So uh, she was easy to work with. She didn't like green peas to eat. And we were farmers, so we ate a lot of green peas. We liked green peas, you know. We ate a lot of them, and Beverly never did catch on to them, still doesn't like them. You mean Vaughn? And Valerie, I mean, uh, Vaughn Le bon didn't uh, ever like them either. And I had to spank her hand like this, you know, she had her fork in her hand, and I said, take your spoon and eat those peas. And uh, she didn't want to do it. She didn't want to do it. And pretty soon she began to tremble. So. I, I had to slap her hand a couple of times, you know, a lot hard, but for a little girl it was probably hard, but my hands were hard. And so we went through that. Um, she never did learn to eat them, still doesn't like them. I can't imagine why. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I said I can't imagine why. She has bad childhood memories about them, probably. Probably does. Yeah. But she... You slap her hand and all. She still remembers, though, that I did that. And um, she still remembers that I was being unreasonably cruel to her, she thought. But she was my daughter, so she right. knew that she had to mind her parents. Okay. We brought them all up. Beverly, this is where Beverly shined. Beverly loves her children. Yes. More than anything in the world. Absolutely. More than you or me or anybody mm -hmm. else. So when when Vaughn was growing up, um, Beverly would give her everything and protect her from things such as cooking. Beverly didn't know how to cook when, I mean, uh, Levon, but she wanted to learn. So she wanted to learn how to cook. But Bev wanted to keep her away from cooking. She wanted to bond, bear, buy, uh, marry someone, I guess, 
who would be able to buy the food already done and eat out or something. Huh. You know, crazy thinking. <laughs> but, um, we'll have to edit that out too. I don't know. Hmm? We might have to edit that out. The She knows what I think. <laughs> I'm sure she does. Okay, so how about Mark? How was Mark as a kid growing up? Mark surprised me. I got a call from the police uh, department in Edmond, uh, not Edmond, in um, Merced, Fresed, Fresno. Maybe it was Merced. Probably was in Merced. Okay. Um, I got a call from the police department, and uh, the sheriff knew I was the banker guy in the town and all, but he. Um, asked me if I knew that his son was, uh, had, a stole, had stolen a, a boy's bicycle. And I said, are you kidding me? I said, he has a bicycle. He doesn't need another bicycle. Why would he steal a bicycle? He said, let me put him on the phone. I thought, oh, why is he doing that there, you know? So Mark came on the phone and he gave me some kind of a, an answer that wasn't a never, no or a yes. And the sheriff told him, tell him the truth. And so Mark came back on the phone and said, I, me and one of the other kids he piled around with had uh, stolen another kid's bike because that kid was, they didn't like him. Okay. So I, I was kind of speechless, you know, and I said, well, what are we going to do with Mark? I said, uh, I want him to get home. Are you going to turn him loose? And he said, yes, you can come and get him, and I did. And I asked Mark, what, why did this happen? Well, he said, well, this guy's a smart ass, and he was going on with uh, how great it was the way he does things, and we were just nothings. So. He said, so we took his bike away. Wait, he said you were nothings, your, his no, parents? He and his friend oh. are talking, he's talking about himself and, and a friend okay. who took the bike from okay. the kid that they didn't like because he was being a smart aleck. The kid that was uh, had the bike was richer family mm -hmm. and wealth was what made you smart, I guess. Okay. They just didn't know. Because that was when he was in still in uh, elementary school. Okay. So what happened? What were the consequences for him stealing the bike? We had a long talk. Yeah. And, and in that talk, he made a promise that I made a promise to him. And the one that he's going to make is he's not going to steal any more bikes. And he didn't. Okay. But he now likes car work. <laughs> okay. And he can fix cars and bikes and stuff like that when he was, even when he was young. He just loved working on on things. Machine, right. Especially things that will turn a wheel and make them go. Okay, and how about your daughter Valerie? Tell me a little bit about Valerie. Oh, you know more about Valerie than I will. <laughs> I've lived with her longer. <laughs> you lived with her longer. Um, Valerie, as a child, what do you remember? As a child, uh, she was um, a very pleasant young lady, girl. Uh, she had an older sister to give her help and guide her. And Vaughn was always good at bossing, and still is. And um, so she, um, she was a, a pleasant person. She was a cute girl. And the people at school um, enjoyed her company enough that she always had lots of friends. If she wanted, she could have as many as she wanted, I guess. And in school, in her grade, uh, by that time, I was deep in banking, bail with business, and nothing really stands out that says other than that she was she was always highly praised by the schools, the teachers, and all that. She liked doing her studies. She didn't need a lot of help on book making grades or anything. Okay. So uh, she was the easy. One. Not so easy for me all the time, but... 
because she knows what she wants and she wants it the way she wants it. Yeah, she's a wonderful, wonderful lady. Yeah, she is. She's, she still is. Absolutely. And then she, she's pretty much, Beverly's biggest help to us was she knew getting ahead through educating and study and honesty and all that was what's so, so important. And that they're not, there's no choice about going or not going to college. You're going to go to college, you're going to get a graduate right. from college. Beverly quit. We got married in December, which was the end of the first uh, half of the year at the college. And as soon as we got married, she dropped, she never did go back and take her, finish her courses. Didn't take her courses and didn't take her tests on the end of the first year, so she's just the same as didn't go, but she did go for the first year. Okay. Um, first half of year. Now I'm going to make you think here for a second. Can you name all of your grandchildren? I can, Drake. Um, my mentor um, name them by each family. Go ahead. Okay, so if the, the first ones were David and Dale. Yes. And they were born up in the Sacramento area here. And we um, came up for them. They were very tiny when they were born. And we came as often as we could afford to, and with time, we wanted money, but the money too. And we uh, went from there, David and Dale. <clears throat> and then um, there's some time between them and Dean. So, and Dean came along later. Okay. And then with um, with uh, Val, with Mark. Mark didn't get married as early as, uh, I don't know whether he was er earlier or, or below Valerie. Yeah, yeah, I don't remember either, to be honest. Yeah. But um, Mark... Oh, it was after Valerie because he got married in Spain and we couldn't go because it was too far away. Right. Right. Yeah. So he got married after Valerie. Okay, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. But he's the middle one in the age. Right. So, but his kids' names are... Um, why would I think that? <laughs> um, Mark's kids. We don't see them as often today as we used to, so that's harder to keep up the names, but I'll get it. But I'm old enough that I keep forgetting things too. I'll give you a hint. The first one starts with M. Yeah, Matthew. And the second one starts with A. With A? Yeah. Alex. And there yeah. you go. Alex's name really isn't Alex. What is it's it? It's Alejandro. It's oh. a Spanish name. I didn't that know that. A dirty one. Very, so, very interesting. But the problem with my memory isn't that I couldn't have sure. remembered it, but I, I, I can forget nouns really easily. Right. And names of nouns. Yeah. So anyway, Matthew... You're and doing Matthew, very well. Yeah. And I <laughs> thought probably Mark would go ahead and try to have a girl. But either she didn't want to, or he decided to change his mind. Or either Matthew so and Alex were just to too much to handle. <laughs> <laughs> Could be. <laughs> and then um, along came Valerie, and with Valerie, uh, you have uh, Todd, and you have your older boy uh, that's off in Oklahoma now. Yes. And his name is. Um, Matthew. No. No, not Matthew. <laughs> um, and I know this is hard when you have to think. It's Brett, obviously. Yeah, Brett. Brett, right. Yeah, Brett. And then they wanted to um, have, you guys wanted to have... A, try one more time. Yeah, one more try. And Beverly was really happy about that, and so was I, because you got a girl. And that, the little girl's name is Dana, and, and she's doing super well in school, I understand. And she's your only granddaughter. It's the only granddaughter in my house. Yeah. 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 But um, she, she's, uh, she has always been, it uh, seems to us, that she wanted to keep up with the boys. And she did a darn good job doing it. Yeah, and so far. And she got smarter than they did even sometimes, I think. So. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> um, okay. She hasn't gotten in, into marriage yet. No, none of them have. No. 
None of the grandkids have. Oh no, David wait. And Dale. David and Dale are the only two. And they haven't got any kids. Not they yet. Talk about it. But they will. They will. Sooner or later. Well, yeah. Okay, so what, so what I was going to ask is if, if you could give any words of advice to your grandkids about how to deal with life in general, since certainly you have lived life, um, what kind of words of advice or wisdom would you give them? I would say the first one would be honesty. It's a good one. And that means with yourself as well as with your in people you meet. Um, education, extremely important because as time goes by, more and more new things are being developed which means you've got to study all the time, for always. Right. You never quit. So therefore you should read, you should be able to um, help the kids, so you, you ought to be able to tell them some, enough that they know you know as much or more than they know, okay. so that they will continue to try to keep up with the parent. Um, I'm trying to think of just a single word like uh, Well, it doesn't have to be a single word, but... Mm -hmm. You can turn that thing off, don't you? No, it's fine. I can, I can fix... You can change it. You don't worry about me. I'll take care of things. <laughs> okay. um, I, I'll come back to that, okay? Okay. Some more names, because there's a, a number of them I've thought of before and used over the years. A number of names, or...? No. A number of, of goals. Right. Things that are important to you or are important to you in your life. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so okay. What makes you have have the desire to, to learn more about the world and what you live in and what other people are doing? Don't just focus on your village. Right. Don't think bigger. Okay. That, I guess that's the way to put it. But think, think bigger. Think bigger. Yeah. And don't put yourself down. Be honest with yourself so you can be proud of whatever it is you're doing, whether it's doing a fixing a flat tire or whether it's teaching a group of students, you know, something. Right. So have confidence in yourself. Yes. Self confidence is very important. Right. Um, variety of things that uh, are happening or that may be happening or have recently happened, be aware of what's happening around you. Okay. So be, being, being aware. Okay. How do you, how do you feel, and, and this will, we'll kind of start wrapping it up here, but you know, you're on, you're going to be 80 next year. So you've seen a lot of things in this world. You've seen a lot of changes in technology and, and things like that. Um, how do you feel right now about the state of the world and, and the people? And Would you say you feel positive or you feel a little skeptical? Or, or where, where do you feel, how do you feel? I think that we have a problem in our government because we do need someone running the nation Okay. And we need cooperation between other nations with us. And it seems like that no one can find a way to reduce those things that are unneeded, that are waste, life waste, and money waste, and progress waste. Okay. And those, pro those wastes cost more than you can imagine or even name unless you study it and learn about it. The news are not always honest, the news reports you get. And or they're biased. There's a bias on every nation's leader mm -hmm. about how his country is doing when he talks to us. And so we think we're getting the truth, truth because it's from him or her. 
right now, Germany is over the herd. Mm -hmm. And if that person uh, that is running the country, he's not following the rules like we think Obama is for our country. But there's people that are running the country who all there is in it, they're in it for is for their own personal gain, it seems. And there's too much of that. I think there's an increase in the problem with um, gay people or lesbian people. And there's no one able to fix that yet. You think that's a problem? I think it is a problem. Okay. Um, it's certainly similar to the days when we didn't allow blacks to go to school with you as you know, if right. you're white. Right. I had that occasion, and it's a civil right. Or are you saying that the gay people deserve the equal rights? Is that what the problem is? Do they do what? Do they deserve the equal rights? No, I don't think that they deserve. Uh, criticism, because I don't think that they, I mean, there are some who are playing the game, I think, okay. but I think the ones that are truly gay, because they were born with a mixed up inside them, okay. I think that's unfortunate that we are making them sometimes kill themselves, just like some of the kids that are fighting in schools for right. other up. reasons, you know. Um, so the, the, what the rest of the world does to your body as you are growing and you're young becomes very important. So the parent has to be careful on making sure that your, their children are with friends as the right people. Okay. You can't have someone that's like that guy that just uh, was on the news about uh, killing right. eight or nine people right. in a church. Right. Things like that should not happen. And we've been on earth long enough, we ought to know a way to stop that. Right. And the leaders of the country should be doing that. And then that, with the same thing with the money, and the, you know, the, they could raise the taxes to the point where we can't afford to get a job. There wouldn't be any money sure. left if you did. Why go to work? Okay. So, uh, yes, there's a lot of doubt in my mouth. <clears throat> and that's what makes, I think, one country become dead and some other company, country takes them over. Okay. We have been stronger, in my opinion, because we have water on both sides of our country. We have two countries, north, south and north of us, that are um, on, on the same uh, islands we're on. But we need to get a goal that's better than self-improvement. Well, not the improvement, but wealth. Okay. They're, they're fighting for walk for money. Okay. And they give their money, they get their money from us, the taxpayer, a lot of them that are working for the government. Remember when the government first started in this nation, uh, the ones that were doing jobs and doing a good job of running their business and so on, they are the ones that became politicians. Not the one, but as a continuation of their kids or whoever took over. Eventually, they work all the time in the government. Whereas those first people would only work maybe in the government for the month it takes them to make up all the rules and the regulations and then they all go back to work. Okay. And then we need that kind of a, a approach again. Okay. In other words, separate myself from my job. Make myself help the whole country, okay. not myself only. Oh, okay. All right, is there anything you poorly, would like? Poorly struck and structured in my speech, but that's what I think. Right. Is there anything you'd like to say in, in closing this interview? What in the hell are we doing in here anyway? <laughs> <laughs> well, I would just like to say 
I'm gonna come over there just so people can see who I am since I'm here. You're gonna what? I'm gonna come over and say hello. Oh. This is my wonderful father-in-law, <laughs> and I just want to say that you have been a wonderful grandpa to my kids. Well, thank and, you. And I have appreciated you since day one. You're a wonderful man, and I'm glad I got to sit down and do this with you. Okay. Well, thank. I'm glad you did too because it makes you happy. Well, uh, it's gonna make a lot of people happy. And it doesn't hurt me a bit. It, it's painless. It's funny sometimes <laughs> uh, what we what we remember. I remember on a date one time with Beverly, uh, we were driving down a country road, grass and weeds and cattle out in the fields and all, and a, a coyote came up and got on the road and um, he was running right down the road down in front of us. So I sped up and she said, be careful, you're going to run over him. And I said, that's what I'm trying to do. And she said, oh, you're a, you know, this was when we were dating, not married. She said, you're a, 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 a what she called me, a barbarian, I think it was. Okay. You're a barbarian. You're killing animals that are, haven't done any damage to you at all. And I said, yeah, but my neighbors have told, just talk to any of them. They'll tell you, they eat their, Chickens, chickens, they eat the eggs, they eat every, kill everything you've got, they ruin their calves and everything else. I said, I would kill any coyote I found on the road any time all the rest of my life, probably. And she just wouldn't talk to me for, I don't know how long, a day or two or something. This is Beverly? Beverly. And she hasn't talked to you since. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she, it would take sense to do it. <laughs> yeah, but that's that was... One of the things, she still holds that great grudge against me. Wow. Oh, still. She's there very well. She never forgets anything. With Beverly, you can go driving through a town that we went through when we were dating, and she can tell you what the streets are and where we went and everything else. Wow. I can't even remember being in the town. Wow. I just, I don't store up everything I learn in my life, you know. Right. And I don't keep it the record unwritten or otherwise. Okay. But, um, she has lots of good teachers, Beverly does. She has a lot of um, experience in life too because she was a waitress and waitresses do see people on the other side of what we see as uh, co-workers or whatever. So she's good at that. She's got three good kids. She's got... Uh, you guys have done a wonderful job raising your kids. Well, she's... Um, you should be proud and happy and... Yeah, she doesn't ask for a lot. I mean, she doesn't want anything. Even when she only has one bra or one pair of pants or something that... And otherwise she'd be wearing dresses. Well, she doesn't need a second. You can't get her to buy one. Simple. You go buy it for her and she'll send them back. Huh. I bought so much for her that she makes me take back. And um, that she just doesn't have self-confidence enough in herself. That I don't know why that is. Okay. But she has some good qualities. She raised oh, some good she children. Has a lot of good qualities, yeah. Yeah. And I don't know that my kids see it all because they got married and sure. they've gone longer than they were there when they were growing up. Right. So um, if if people could be, mm, I don't know how to say it, but just more honest with themselves. They're not perfect either. Sure, no one's perfect. If you're going to be giving in input on how to live, you ought to be thinking in a lot bigger picture than just what your goals are. Okay. So she, I think she could do that. Okay. She doesn't think about herself. She, she doesn't. No, she's all about everybody else. She's all about helping the kids. She's not too much worried about me because she thinks I've got an easy life. And I don't want this on the screen. Or screen. It doesn't have to be <laughs> anything, but uh, all right. you can take that off. Okay. Well, let's just say goodbye. Give a little thank you and wave. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Over and over. <laughs> All right. See ya, Grandpa. Okay.